When I was growing up, there was a boy who lived next door to me. We were about the same age, we liked all the same things, but I could walk, and he couldn't. I had this wonderful, childlike belief that if you put in enough hard work and there was a little bit of magic, you could achieve pretty much anything. Keep in mind that for the majority of my childhood, I believed that I was going to be able to fly. The sky was literally the limit for me. So I decided to teach my neighbour how to walk. I would pull him up out of his wheelchair, lay him down on the couch and move his legs in a walking pattern, somehow just expect that he would start walking. Of course he couldn't. He had severe damage to his spinal cord. I got in a lot of trouble from his parents when they found out what I was doing. And I managed to get away with my parents never finding out about it uh, until today. <laughs> Hi, Dad. I haven't grown up. I still maintain this ridiculous, childlike belief that with a lot of hard work, you can do anything. But I don't really rely on magic anymore. I've had to use something else. My brain. See, since I was about 12, I started to get sick all the time. People would say I was so unlucky picking up every sniffle and cough that was going around. When I'd faint all the time, they said I had tall person's disease. It wasn't until my first year in university when I was finally diagnosed with immune deficiency and a blood pressure disorder. Now, it's been years. So I've been handballed around to different specialists, trying to find a suitable treatment. And I now receive a product that's made from your blood plasma. It's been an incredible gift. I know a lot of you already donate blood, but I'd encourage anyone to go down to your local Red Cross and try donating plasma. You can do it every two weeks, and it goes so much further than you'd think. And you'd be a hero, especially to someone like me. But I digress. It wasn't easy studying neuroscience and rarely being able to attend class. But I managed to scrape through by using new and innovative ways to study. The irony of this was quite lost on me at the time. I was studying neuroscience, and at the same time, I was training my own brain in new ways to help remember information. It wasn't until towards the end of my degree that I heard this fantastic word, neuroplasticity. This word managed to encapsulate everything I love about the brain and its amazing powers. It also described what I'd been doing as I was studying. So let me break it down for you. We all have a critical period when we're young, when we learn at an incredibly rapid rate. We learn how to eat, to move, to use language, and to interact with one another. It was previously thought that once our bodies stopped growing, our brains stopped growing too. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? It's actually wrong. We now know that while we never learn as quickly as we did in that critical period when we're young, that our brains continue to change and grow over our entire lifespans. It's plastic. This should be evident in your everyday life. The more you do something, the easier it becomes. Now, how many of you have tried to cartwheel as an adult? I know I have. It probably hurt, right? Probably made a bit of a fool of yourself. Now, this is neuroplasticity at work. You are unable to cartwheel as well as you could when you were a child, simply because it's been so long. And if you don't use a brain pathway often enough, you actually start to lose it. And conversely, if you're cartwheeling all the time and you're practicing and making that brain pathway fire, it makes it easier for it to fire in future. So it is possible for you all to cartwheel again. 
Just practice. Make those brain pathways fire. And you're getting older, so be sure to stretch first. <laughs> so neuroplasticity is so much more than just how we learn. It's your brain's ability to change its own structure and to change its own function based on inputs that we give it from our actions, from our senses, and even from our thoughts. There are so many remarkable stories of people that can lose whole chunks of their brain and be rehabilitated to full or almost full function because their brain was actually able to rewire itself around the damaged areas. It's completely amazing to me. So I now spend a lot of my time trying to use and abuse neuroplasticity. My work is in Parkinson's disease. It's a horrible thing. And it particularly affects a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. Now your basal ganglia has a role in helping to control your movements. And that's why people with Parkinson's disease often present with a tremor and slowness of movement, trouble walking. The basal ganglia is also responsible for taking in all of that information from your senses and mapping it out onto your motor movements, which is why people with Parkinson's quite often have severe problems with their balance and a sense of where they are in space. That's called proprioception. Now, your brain is pretty good, but it's not quite good enough to say, hey, this pathway just started firing pretty weirdly. Maybe I'll make a new one on my own. Nobody ever lost a whole chunk of their brain and was fully rehabilitated by watching Netflix on the couch. So what can we do? The question I most commonly ask by my participants with Parkinson's disease is what's the best thing I could be doing? And my answer to them is really simple. Exercise and don't give up on yourself. In Parkinson's, like in anything, improvement with exercise can reach a plateau. And it's really, really hard to keep going when you're not seeing any improvement. And in Parkinson's, you're also faced with a losing battle with time because the disease is progressive and getting worse. So what can we do to overcome this? In one of my research studies, I had my participants with Parkinson's disease practice their handwriting at every session for four weeks. All up, it was only 12 sessions. But I was met with a few grimaces when I asked them to do this. You see, people with Parkinson's disease often present with micrographia, which means their handwriting gets really tiny and slanted. They also have a lot of stiffness and tremor in their hands, making their writing really messy and almost unreadable. A lot of them also suffer from cognitive impairment, which means they're frequently forgetting words and spelling them incorrectly. So you can understand why most of them would do almost anything to get out of it. But I'm cruel and I made them write anyway. In this image, you can see one man's handwriting at his very first session. I'm sure you can recognise some of those traits I just mentioned. The sentence I've asked him to write here is the fox jumps in the round box at night. Now, after only 12 sessions, you can see the remarkable improvement. Now, I wish I could describe to you the look on his face when I showed him these two images. I saw the spark. And in that moment, Parkinson's stopped being about losing things to him. And it stopped being about just getting worse all the time. Maybe he could turn back the clock. In my work, I use non-invasive brain stimulation. It sits on the scalp and it excites your underlying neurons, getting them all warmed up and ready to fire. Now, I combine this with special exercises aimed at improving their balance and that sense of where they are in space, called proprioception. By doing this, I'm helping those new pathways in the brain fire, helping them learn faster. Now, I combine this with special exercises aimed at improving their balance and that sense of where they are in space, called proprioception. 
By doing this, I'm helping those new pathways in the brain fire, helping them learn faster. Speeding up the learning process is so important in people with neurodegenerative conditions because, put simply, they don't have time to waste. They're also so accustomed to that improvement plateau. I'm only in the early stages of my studies. But in one of my sessions, a participant came in with a massive grin on his face. He'd just been on a trip with his lovely wife. And as he was getting off the bus, he tripped on the handle of a bag on the ground outside. He was so astonished, he said to me, I tripped, but I didn't fall. I kept my balance. And that might not mean a lot to you. But to someone with Parkinson's disease, it's monumental. A fall can be devastating to them. It can mean going to hospital, being exposed to infection. It can mean bed rest, taking them away from their physical activity. It can reduce their independence even further. Falls can be devastating to a person with Parkinson's disease and any elderly population. Which is why one of my primary aims in my research is to reduce the risk of falls in Parkinson's disease. Now, we're only just scratching the surface when it comes to understanding the brain. It's an exciting time to be a neuroscientist. I'm really excited. And I can see that the more we learn about the brain, the more ways we're learning how to maximise its potential and helping people live their best lives. Now, we're already seeing research studies showing that people with cognitive impairment can improve when using this non-invasive brain stimulation when you combine it with cognitive training. More impressively to me are the studies that show that people can actually improve when they have cognitive impairment when using non-invasive brain stimulation and treadmill walking. Now keep in mind, when we're talking about cognitive impairment, this is things like dementia. So can you imagine if you could improve someone's memory just by going for a walk? It's incredible. And it's real. So I want to leave you with one thought. No change whether it's in your brain or in your life, is going to be possible unless you believe you're capable of making that change. Motivation is everything you need. You might fail. It happens. But you have to ask yourself, what's my goal? Do I want to learn French? Do I want to be able to run as fast as I could when I was a teenager? Or do you simply want to be able to go to the grocery store again on your own? In order to begin, you need a pinch of that childlike belief that anything is possible. Because you know what? I believe we will make paraplegics walk again one day. Probably not with my earlier technique. <laughs> and. I believe that affordable jetpacks aren't too far in the near future, and I will be able to fly. <laughs> Everything you need is already inside of you. Remember, you have a wonderful plastic brain. You are capable of anything. <laughs>